Welcome to Soft Talk. Today's Soft Talk vlog is a tribute to Nepal's neutral foreign policy. It is titled The Swiss Knife and the Swiss Neutrality. I came across a gem of a news just the other day. Indeed, high heavens have been exceptionally kind to me these days. That's why I get to read amazing news reports every now and then. These reports I get to read even in these distressing times when peace is in pieces at the global, regional, national and individual levels. Without much ado, let me share with you the news in question. Yes, our Foreign Minister, Narayan, Dr. Narayan Khadka, waxing eloquent on a balanced and independent foreign policy. This news was published in the state-run The Rising Nepal Daily. I'll share the link of that report with you. An RSS report. An RSS report. By the way, RSS in this piece means Rashtriya Samachar Samiti and not the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh of India, that dreaded organization. It quoted Minister for Foreign Affairs, Dr. Naran Khadka, as saying that safeguarding sovereignty, territorial integrity, national independence, and protection of national interest has been at the core of Nepal's foreign policy all along. Addressing the Professor Y. N. Kanal lecture series under the ages of our very own Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Kathmandu, Dr. Khadka said, Nepal will continue to be committed to a balanced and independent foreign policy based on national interests. As per the report, the keynote speaker at the program, Dr. Surya Prasad Subedi said, Nepal could consider moving towards adopting a policy of Swiss type permanent neutrality for the benefit of the Nepali people and those of the wider Hindukus Himalayan belt. Let me share with you another report about this permanent neutrality thing, Nepal's independent foreign policy and this importance of maintaining a neutral foreign policy, a non-aligned foreign policy. This report quoted Dr. Subedi as saying that this report quoted Professor Dr. Surya Subedi as saying that uh, Nepal, given the unfolding new dynamics of international relations, this region may once again be drawn into the conflict over the expansion of the spheres of influence of different international acts. Therefore, many of the foreign policy challenges for Nepal are as great today as they have been in the past. The report has stressed that Nepal should adopt 
a foreign policy with a global outlook, something that goes beyond the management of relations with her two immediate neighbors. It has pointed that this would enable Nepal to gain power and influence in regional politics and make inroads into global politics. That's a lofty goal indeed. In retrospect, the YN Canal lecture series is indeed a great initiative and a fitting tribute to the pioneer diplomat to the pioneer to the pioneer diplomat of Nepal, Professor Yadunath Kanal, who, who had received an honorary doctorate from the Trivuan University in fitting recognition of his scholarship and contribution to diplomacy. During a meeting with Professor Kanal at his home in Paneswar in the late 90s for an interview, I had learned, I learned quite a bit about the depth of scholarship and diplomatic acumen of Professor Kanal. Professor Kanal was well versed in Sanskrit, English, and Nepali languages. Such was the aura of his scholarship and diplomatic skills that Dr. Kanal got this rare opportunity to serve as Nepal's ambassador to the United States, China, and India. These countries are very important for Nepal. Some of the most important countries for Nepal. Now, let me continue with who said what at that program, at that lecture series. Let me start, restart, I mean, with Foreign Minister Dr. Kharka, who outlined that safeguarding sovereignty, territorial integrity, national independence, and protection of national interest has been at the core of Nepal's foreign policy all along. Despite this stated goal, has the Nepali state not been veering off quite far, quite afar from it for decades on end? Have we, the people, not been witnessing, albeit helplessly, a constant violation of national sovereignty and territorial integrity, even as the Nepali state keeps paying lip service to neutrality in the wake of cold or not so cold wars while aligning more and more with a specific camp. Let me start with the 1950s Treaty of Peace and Friendship with India that came in the wake of perceived or real threats from, from the Northern Nepal neighbor. Was it not a desperate attempt on the part of a dying, tyrannical Rana regime to remain in power at the expense of Nepal and successive generations of Nepalese? In the larger context, was it not meant to give a neighbor an upper hand in Nepal? Then came the Kosi Agreement the first major move of the Nepali Congress-led Matrika Prasad Koirala government. This agreement came despite, despite widespread, uh, widespread protests at that time. Was this agreement, which made way for the Koshi Barrage, not meant to benefit Nepal at the expense of Nepal and successive generations of Nepalese. Was it not some sort of a return on investment, investment that New Delhi had made in the movement designed to overthrow a dictatorial regime and install in its place a puppet regime wearing the garb of wearing the garb of democracy? 
has it not turned the Kosi river called the sorrow of Bihar back then into the sorrow of Nepal? We were talking of how this Kosi river has turned into a sorrow of Nepal. So let's continue with that. Then came the move of the BP Koirala government to let New Delhi establish Indo-Tibetan border police posts in northern parts of Nepal. Was this move in our national interest? Was it not another instance of blatant violation of Nepal's national sovereignty? Did it not lead to foreign mil military presence in the Nepali territory of Lipu Lake, Limpiadura, Kalapani, that is about 400 square kilometers of area of a very, very uh, much strategic importance. It is of paramount strategic importance. The Gandak Agreement, another major move of the BP Koirala led Nepali Congress government, comes next. The agreement ended up gifting another vital river system of Nepal, the Saptagandaki River, to India. This was perhaps in recognition of the latter's role in ousting the tyrannical Rana regime, and this agreement, this agreement also came despite protests from the Nepali people. Then comes the Mahakali Treaty. Signing of the treaty was the first major move of the Girja Prasad Koirala led Nepali Congress government that came to power after the success of the 1990s movement for multi party democracy with constitutional monarchy. The treaty effectively gave away the Mahakali River to India, in perhaps in recognition of the latter's support for the movement. This gifting of our lifelines, our rivers and streams continue to date with utter disregard for our very own water and electricity needs. Also, it is no coincidence that after every political movement that happens in Nepal, without fail in a space of a decade or so the ongoing on the oncoming regime every oncoming regime seeks to change the cutoff date for acquiring the nepali citizenship certificate this tweaking of citizenship laws ends up benefiting lakhs of people from the extended volatile neighborhood these people enter nepal through a border that is open on our side. Does it strengthen our national sovereignty and territorial integrity? Will the likes of Dr. Khadka bother to explain? Even after the abolition of the monarchy and the establishment of a federal democratic secular republican system, encroachment upon Nepal's sovereign space continues. While borders continue to bleed in places like the Limpia Dura, Lipulek, Kalapani, Sista, Kanchanpur, Jhapa, and Ilam, not a day passes by without reports of fresh incursions upon Nepali territories. This makes people like me wonder as if this fledgling nation were at a war with a super powerful neighbor. This at a time when we have almost become a junior partner of an alliance clamoring for global supremacy. Of course, foreign policy alone is not to blame for this weakening of Nepal's national sovereignty over the decades. But Dr. Kharka would do well to not forget that Nepal has suffered the most when she had chosen to join an alliance 
while paying lip service to ideals like neutrality. What interests will this move serve? Only time will tell. Hopefully, let's hope that we will be alive to tell the tale. In hard times like these, let's hope that Dr. Suvedi's prescription of Swiss type neutrality will the Swiss type neutrality will be as effective as the Swiss knife, as useful as the Swiss knife, if not more. Let Lord Pasupatinath and Goddess Parvati bless us and protect us all. With this remark, I wrap up this edition of Soft Talk. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening.